Hello, welcome to the uh, last session of the day uh, on forensic analysis techniques in general. So we, we have a, a mix of, of three techniques here. So two of them are spanning a couple of abstraction layers. So we've got uh, some application level analysis, some file system level analysis, and also some uh, general, oops, general techniques around um, lookup strategies in digital forensics. So uh, we've got a bus to catch uh, at half past, uh, sorry, at 16.45, so I have to be quite strict on time on these. So no further, further ado, can I introduce Harold Beyer, who's going to talk about the efficiency of artifact lookup strategies in digital forensics. So welcome to... Um to, to our joint paper, um, mainly it was coordinated by Lawrence Liefler, who gave a talk in the previous session about APX BIN, um, and the scope is the same, so um, therefore he's the main author. Patrick Schmidt was a master student uh, of Lorenz, um, who originates from the Technical University of Darmstadt. My affiliation is um, Hochschule Darmstadt, uh, I'm leading the ASIC Biometrics and Internet Security Research Group, and I'm also involved in this um, IT Research Center, CRISP, in Darmstadt. And finally, um, we also have a joint um, work with Frank Breitinger, who is also very familiar with this topic. Um, the agenda um, of my talk is to give a small motivation, although um, the scope already was mentioned um, a few times in the previous session. Um, we investigated three candidates for the lookup problem. Um, I will highlight them in the second part of my talk. Um, then I will give you some insights in the requirements for the candidates and their previous and final capabilities. Um, and then I will give you some information about extensions which we um, provided in our um, work. Um, I will sketch evaluation and then I will conclude. So the motivation um, in the um, invited talk tomorrow was called um, data density. Uh, so uh, there was this exorbitant number of some exabytes per DNA gram. Um, uh, we call this data overload, and what you see are two pictures, maybe the picture from some years ago and um, on the left side, and also the picture also some years ago, because a hard disk drive is not that common in today's investigation. But um, the motivation for our work is that uh, in an ordinary um, case um, for a forensic investigation, you have some storage media, heterogeneous, but you have to deal with different terabytes of data, terabytes, yeah. Not yet petabytes, but maybe terabytes. This is our use case. Um, and if you think going through that for finding relevant artifacts, uh, I think the following picture is um, very helpful. Uh, one terabyte of data, if you think of um, print out text, uh, and you print it on um, a page where one page hosts 5,000 characters, then you have 220 million of pages, and uh, if you um, look at the weight of this paper, then you have one million kilograms. So this, the motivation which you keep in mind is you cannot work with that by hand. So you have the forensic investigator, it's, for instance, this person, and then um, when you start, you have bulk data, and this is the haystack, and then your task is to find relevant data, and relevant data means that you have to find the needle. This is what you are searching for. For instance, um, the, the relevant question is you have different terabytes of data, and then do you find any artifacts of child abuse pictures? Uh, then the child abuse picture or a deleted fragment of that would be the needle for which you are looking for. So, and then you need automated pre-filtering. And the community so far discusses about um, two approaches uh, to find the needle in the haystack. The first approach is to decrease which is not relevant. So to decrease the haystack, which means reduce the haystack. Uh, um, or what is 
uh, in my perception, more relevant is to increase the needle, which means to help by filtering in artifacts which are candidates for those artifacts for which you are actually looking for. Um, in this use case, approximate matching is a topic which is now let's say 15 years old. Yeah, and in the previous session you had um, this malware analysis as one use case, uh, and the general uh, pipeline is, uh, as you see now on, on this slide. First, you have a data set of, of the needles, yeah, of, of, um, of data for which you are looking for. Uh, so, and um, because it's a needle, it's what you're looking for, it's, uh, it's a blacklist. Um, and the first um, phase is the construction phase, which um, for, for the approximate matching use case means that you um, take an input file, um, you extract features or blocks. A block is a characteristic block, typically. Um, and for um, space uh, conditions, you hash them. Yeah, you cannot uh, store the whole data as it is, but you hash them. Uh, and then you insert this in this database, and databases in quotation marks because you, you should not think about a classical database. Yeah? In this malware analysis paper in the last session, I think it was SQLite, um, but in the general case, you cannot um, expect that it's really a database format. Um, and we're talking about the fuzzy nature of input data, and fuzzy nature means that you cannot sort it in a straightforward way. So this is what you should keep in mind. And therefore, approximate matching. We are looking for needles which are similar to other ones. So this is where you construct your database, your data set, which you will use later on to decide if, during the lookup phase, the second phase, you have then a device, which is maybe relevant in your case. And then you proceed similar. You take an input data stream, for instance, a file, a deleted file, or a fragment. Then you extract the features again. Uh, you hash them, and then you look in your database if you find something where you think it's similar or it's exactly the same for which you are looking for. And this is the automated filtering uh, process. So, but once again, um, we have a fuzzy nature of input data, and this means it's not that obvious um, how to decide about a membership. Uh, and if you take the naive general approach, you have to compare something on your seized device against all elements from your database from the construction phase. And this doesn't scale very well. So this is what we call the database lookup problem. Decide about membership, but being better than a brute force comparison. So this summarizes again. Um, we are looking in this paper for efficient, only efficiency. We don't uh, care about accuracy or any, um, any classification. Uh, matrix. We are looking for efficient in the sense of runtime performance. Uh, in the use case, white blacklisting, or one of our candidates comes from uh, the carving um, use case. And we, um, we generally think that we have a large corpus with which we are dealing. So, and then we looked, um, what does the community provide? Candidates which are already somehow related to the digital forensics community or which are so uh, interesting that we can um, take them into account. Um, further goals, uh, this was also uh, already mentioned in, um, in the previous session, that we are looking for blocks which are somehow characteristic for an artifact. Uh, if you think of the, um, of, uh, the identification of, of a malware portable executable, you have some sections where you have static um, 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 file information inside, which is not relevant for a specific file. And this is um, what is um, meant by the deduplication phase within our, um, our work. And then once the construction phase is finished, you can also think about how static is um, this database, uh, or uh, take it the other way, is it possible to add or to remove elements after the construction phase is, is finished? So the candidates. Um, three widespread candidates, I said. And the first one is uh, one from Simpson Garfinkel, um, and um, McCurran from um, the DFRWS workshop four years ago. 
Uh, and this is also used in the well-known bulk extractor tool. So um, uh, this is, um, and one main reason uh, we chose it is because it goes through the whole um, pipeline I just mentioned. Um, the second candidate are hierarchical bloom filter trees. Um, this is a concept which is now about five years old and which we use um, in, our, um, in our software for, for this time. Um, and the final one is, which is from the database community, something which has the best uh, lookup complexity, namely a constant one. It's uh, a hash map um, or a hash table. And last year at the C++ Now conference, uh, Maldes Karupke claimed that he has um, the best performing um, hash table, which he called uh, a flat hash map. So this was our pre-selection. So we investigated these three candidates, some more details on these candidates, um, the hash DB or this hash um, based carving from, um, from Garfinkel uh, actually uses a database format which is mapped um, in, in the memory uh, it, uh, in a light way. So this is the LMDB format. Um, in the paper four years ago, they take two data sets, a small one and uh, a larger one which comprises about one million um, files. Um, and it features um, um, multi-threading by design, uh, and it's therefore read-optimized. Um, and it has a built-in deduplication, which means that Garfinkel um, emphasizes that he's interested in characteristic artifacts of a specific file. So he wants to prevent um, what we call multi-hit or uh, what, we, uh, what you can call a common block, uh, something which uh, is shared uh, within several files. In the HDB, you can add and delete items after the construction phase. Um, and for the block building, which I explain in a minute, they use a fixed sliding window. Um, in our work, we often make use of bloom filters. Uh, this image, um, if you're not aware, with, with bloom filters uh, should um, give you a small example how a bloom filter works. A bloom filter is very space efficient. So this was the reason why it is used in some approximate matching algorithms. For instance, Vasil Rousseff uses it for his SD hash, for storing his uh, SD uh, hash fingerprint. Um, and what you here see is you have three elements, X, Y, Z, and these are represented by 18 bits, 18 bits. Uh, less than three bytes. Um, and the proceeding is very simple. Uh, you insert the first element X into the Bloom filter by simply computing three values. Typically, it's a hash value, and then you have the index within your Bloom filter. So this means the X sets this one at this position, at this position, and at this position. And you proceed with Y and Z in the same way. But what you also see on this image is that this position is switched. The blue filter originally has only zeros. And when you insert an element, you switch to the one if the certain index uh, is reached. So, but what you see here is that this one is actually reached by two different elements. Uh, and this is what the bloom filter is not aware of. The bloom filter itself doesn't know how often uh, a certain position would be switched to one. Uh, actually, at least it was one element, but it can be more elements. <laughs> So then later at the lookup phase, if you want to decide if the if, uh, presented element W is in the set, in this set here, you simply take the same approach. You compute the three positions, and then you look, are there ones? Because if W is in the set, then all three positions must be set to one. This is okay here. This is okay here. But at this position, you see, there is no one, so this means W cannot be element of the set. However, if W would match, let's say, to this one, uh, this can also happen by this uh, Y element. So a Bloom filter has false positives. It doesn't have false negatives, but it has false positives. So when we came up with Bloom filters um, for deciding about membership, then, this is now, uh, I think, four or five years ago, um, um, the idea is to take a large bloom filter, the root bloom filter, decides about the actual membership. But then you don't know which individual file is it, and to 
come up with the individual file, you have to traverse this bloom filter, and in these leaf nodes here, you have a small set of files which you can compare by hand. So this is the main idea of, um, of the plume, of the hierarchical plume filter tree. So, and this concept was um, implemented two years ago um, by some people from the University College of Dublin um, and with Frank, um, and this is some sort of proof of concept. This works. Um, interesting for the lookup complexity is that um, instead of ON, N is the number of elements in the data set, uh, this is decreased to um, the log of N, which is okay, but you have false positives. Uh, I mentioned that um, already, um, and one really problem with bloom filters is um, inserting or deleting elements. Inserting is somehow possible, but deleting is not possible because you don't know if the one in the bloom filter is also set by some other element. Uh, so uh, you cannot really delete elements, and this is what you should um, keep in mind when you later on talk about the evaluation. Um, the next slide is uh, some information about the flat hash table. Once again, a hash table itself has a, comp uh, a constant um, lookup complexity. Uh, so um, at the first glance, you would say you must make use of a hash table, but uh, you're not aware how long does it take to construct it, what are the memory consumptions, and things like that. Um, the hash table of uh, Maldes Karubke um, has different features which makes it very attractive for our purpose. One is that to, um, due to the Robin Hood hashing, you can um, uh, ensure that um, an element actually is close to its ideal position. And it has no false positives. Okay. That you have a rough understanding of the three candidates. Uh, they are either very attractive, like the flat hash map, or they are um, they are already discussed in the forensic community. Um, I will show you only um, a very short um, <clears throat> part of what we did in um, the requirements and capability section, um, but what is important uh, in our perception is that you actually have discriminative blocks, uh, or to put it the other hand, um, a, a multi-hit, is a block which appears frequently in different files. For instance, parts of the file header. Or if you have um, a popular um, um, software library which is statically linked to some, uh, to some executable, then you will find this code or this, um, this information in different files, and this is not really discriminative. So what we want to avoid is multi-hit, and um, this is also supported by this hash DB approach um, of Garfinkel. <laughs> so actually this is um, the core result of our um, uh, capability and requirements analysis. What you see in the left column are the main requirements and some further information. You see the storing technique, for instance. Block building means how to extract these characteristic <laughs> blocks or the blocks from a given file, from a given artifact. And the semantics is as follows. Uh, if a cell is green, then this means originally the, this was not part of this concept, but we successfully um, um, implemented it or provided a concept and implemented it. Uh, for the block building, this was not really um, complicated <coughs> because uh, we used it for our different um, approximate matching approaches. Um, the block hashing you see um, is in, in, this, um, in this row. Um, an important aspect to our, um, to our perception is that, um, at least at the lookup phase, um, it's possible to, um, to perform multi-threading, uh, simply for performance reasons. You don't want to uh, wait for hours or days um, for the result but the real time should be decreased by some parallelization. We have multi-hit handling, uh, and what you see here, actually this should be, this should be um, a, a red color. This is somehow changed here. Um, what I already said, that for the hierarchical plume filter trees, it's hard to insert elements. Uh, this means this partially, and the caret means that uh, it's 
practically impossible to introduce a deletion um, in the bloom filter after the construction phase. This is practically not possible uh, without losing the good um, properties of the hierarchical bloom filter tree. And you have some more information. If you're interested, you can have a look at the paper. So which extensions? I just will sketch it in, um, um, in one slide and give you an information for only one item of that. The multi-hit prevention was not possible for the hierarchical bloom filter tree or for the flat hash map. We provided the concept and um, also an implementation for that. What you here see is that for the hierarchical bloom filter tree, we um, have two concepts and we evaluated that and the global filter-based one was um, the better one. Um, the parallelization of block building, I will give you a short um, insight in the actual problem and the concept. Uh, I talked about characteristic blocks which you want to extract. So think of this as a file which has eight characteristic blocks. Uh, then you have some algorithm which finds C1, it's the first characteristic block, then you find this boundary, then you go to C2 and so on. Uh, if you have no parallelization, you start at the beginning of the file and, some, uh, uh, and, and here you will end up. So the problem is if you now want to parallelize um, this, then if you have four threads, you take four segments of the file, but then if you start at the beginning, it's no problem, but if you start at this position here, uh, then you don't know where is the next boundary for the characteristic block. Uh, but that's not really hard because you can go then to the next point, <coughs> you start there, uh, and then you go as long as you're in the next segment. So actually from the conceptual point of view, this is not really hard, uh, and therefore we integrated that in our um, implementation. Um, one sample runtime for that. Um, we have the real time, the wall clock time in the first row and um, the processor time in um, the bottom row. And what you see here is uh, the wall clock time if you only make use of uh, one thread for um, a data set of about two gigabytes is roughly 44 seconds. Uh, the CPU time is a bit um, lower. But actually what is of interest for us, uh, the time, the real time, decreases to less than one-third if we make use of, um, of multi-threading. Um, uh, so actually this works and this decreases the, the, the overall lookup time. Um, then finally we provide some evaluation with respect to different aspects. The first one is the memory consumption. Uh, the larger the data set is, also the larger will be the memory consumption. So this is one important aspect, and this shows that um, the flat hash map and um, the hierarchical bloom filter trees are approximately the same. Uh, the bloom filters are a bit better for, for um, the memory footprint. <clears throat> then the runtime of the construction phase, we evaluated in both modes, if we only have a single thread or if we have... Um, more threads, um, it, uh, it had been eight in our evaluation, and the same we did for um, the deduplication and also for, um, for the lookup phase. And um, I will show you only some results for the runtime performance of our, um, um, of our um, lookup, um, of the lookup phase. Um, what you see here, this is only runtime measuring. The runtime is here on the vertical axis, the runtime in seconds. Uh, and what you see here is um, the question, how does the runtime depend on, um, on the matching of the artifacts? And what we did is we compared um, identical files against each other, and then you have this picture here. And you see that the hash DB is the slowest one if you compare uh, full identical files. So then this number here means that if per design um, the seized, the seized um, information is only 75% of the original ones, then you have a decrease of the runtime of the hash DB. This is due to pre-filtering um, and so on. Interesting here is that if we look at the 
actual practical relevant picture means that we have a multi-threaded um, use case and you see that the gap between the hierarchical plume filter trees and the flat hash map is not as large as you may expect uh, because the theoretical runtime of um, the plume filter tree and the flat hash map um, is log n to constant uh, and the hash db is much slower. And this is the overall picture um, where we did some um, assessment of the different aspects. And um, if you go through the different columns, uh, columns, you see that the hash DB has all the features before. Uh, we implemented that for uh, HBFT and the flat hash map. Uh, but what you see then is in the actual um, system which you are interested in later when uh, finding the needle that the flat hash map uh, is the best one uh, the hierarchical plume filter tree is the second one and the hash db um, suffers from some uh, deficiencies this is the conclusion uh, flat hash map outperforms both other candidates um, uh, the hierarchical plume filter tree is per design as it is. Yeah, we cannot um, improve it without losing its uh, original conceptual advantages, and therefore we will make use of the flat hash map <laughs> in, um, in our memory carving engine. Um, get in contact if you're interested in this or APX bin or uh, similar things if you're still at... Uh, um, junior level or so and you want to do an internship at CRISP, you're welcome to contact us. Thanks. Uh, any questions? Hi, yeah. So, oh, thanks very much for your talk. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, how does this approach scale when the uh, the scale of files that you're that you're looking up uh, grows exponentially? So, like you know, uh, what, what are the limits to the advantages here, if if indeed there are any? Actually, the scaling question is um, is a good one. Um, you have these theoretical estimations, at least for for the bloom filter trees, which should be log during the lookup phase. We're only talking about the lookup phase and a constant one for the flat hash map. Uh, in our um, evaluation, we made use of a two gigabyte data set. So we have to increase this more. Um, but my guess is that the data set must become really large, that this, um, this gap becomes larger between the bloom filter trees and the flat hash map. Uh, actually, uh, for the hash DB, this is a database approach. I'm not aware of any of any uh, theoretical scaling behavior. Right. Any more questions? Uh, okay, let's just ask you one. Um, can, can one. Just, <laughs> well, just one question. Yeah. Um, where, in terms of these different techniques, where are we in terms of, I guess, technology readiness levels? You mentioned bulk extractor. Are these, are these in commercial tools? Are these just implemented in other circumstances? With respect to this question, uh, you should make use of this hash DB. Yeah? And this is yeah. what uh, in, in the keynote this morning was, uh, don't keep in uh, your academic world, go out and convince uh, practitioners to make use of that. Um, the hash DB is rolled out as part of the bulk extractor. Um, and the other thing is, um, Somehow we provide this on GitHub, uh, so feel free to make use of that. And uh, actually, I think this is a general remark that we don't really look at um, the impact for, for practitioners. Yeah. But you can use it. It's, it's on GitHub. Yeah. But it's, I'm not sure to say anything about ready for market. Okay. No, that's great. It's academic software so far. <laughs> okay. Thank you again. It's fantastic.